Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Treasurer. Now well, it's good afternoon, officially. Yeah, <laughs> point taken. Uh, first, at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, when, as it relates to revenue projections and uh, assumed future growth uh, projections, that you tend to be conservative and or maybe mostly pessimistic. As it relates to, relates to pension funds and the 7.5% uh, assumed rate of return, what are your thoughts on, on, on the sustainability of that and the uh, realistic uh, uh, stand, your, your stance of how realistic that is. Right, and, and um, uh, I should correct myself and say, if I have an optimistic forecast, I feel like I need a mountain of data to say why I'm so optimistic, right? Um, and we can go into that, but the, the short answer is I think we've got it roughly right now. We had it wrong when I came into office. So understand every, Every point you want to raise your, your uh, assumed rate of return, you, you theoretically are driving down your unfunded liability. So if you want to say you're going to get a 25% annual return, gee, doesn't that look good? We just got rid of most of our unfunded liability, but we all know that sort of fantasy finance. I think we have a relatively prudent set of actuarial assumptions when you're thinking in 20-year arcs, which tend to be the, the, the amount of money that you're putting in, so long as you can afford to put a chunk of the money from what they call the investable corpus into risk assets or illiquid assets. If what you do is you keep driving down the amount of money you have to invest, that you have to keep it all parked in fixed income because you have bills coming due right away, your, your rate of return will go down on a spiraling basis, and then your actuarial assumption is wildly optimistic. So you need to have it closer to fully funded, and then it's a prudent, a, a prudent uh, uh, Mr. Treasurer. You, you, you're confident that 7.5% is what you're getting at is, is fairly realistic. As long as we fund the employer contribution, yes. Okay. And, and so with that said, the, I think the minority chairman uh, yesterday had mentioned that not wasn't convinced that we have a pension problem here in Pennsylvania, but looking at a, a $50 billion unfunded liability, is it under your impression that uh, – uh, like the gentle lady said today uh, in the previous uh, hearing, that sh you know we need real pension reform. Are you do you agree with the, the well, need I, for real pension reform? Yeah, and for, there is a structural problem. First, I would say a problem is different from uh, a crisis. Second, I think we had real pension reform in 2010. It was a little imperfect from my point of view, but we had real pension reform. It addressed the long-term cost of the pension and re pensions and reduced them by uh, more than $30 billion. Um, and, and it drove down, not up, the total unfunded liability. That, to me, those, if you say, is it affordable, sustainable, and does it drive down the unfunded liability, drive it down, that makes me think it's real reform. If all you're doing is asking for another holiday, you're, you're, you're so, so. I'm not asking that. I'm asking yeah. at a $50 billion unfunded liability, as the, as you the mentioned, problem. that. So, so the CEO or the CEO of the uh, state, as you mentioned at the beginning, do we have a structural pension problem? We, we have, I wouldn't call it structural. I would, I would say we have a problem, and we have to decide how to fund it. And that's, the, the, you know, I know it's a nuance, but it's a, it's a, so when I say structural, this is really important. I'm one of the very few sort of business types who's been out here for years saying, I know it's tempting to say 401ks are more efficient than defined benefit plans, right? First, you'd better be careful saying you're against all DB plans, defined benefit plans, because one of them's called social security. Second, you really want to mend it, not end it, because these defined benefit plans are more, not less efficient than 401ks. 401ks. The people who convince us that 401ks are great are the people who sell 401ks. The actual admin fee is 1% more per year in a 401k than it is in a defined benefit plan, which makes sense because you're aggregating the purchasing power of these large amounts of money. Even more important, you get 70 basis points better annual return on average from a defined benefit plan. Over time, you get almost twice as money paid out to actual senior citizens per dollar in when you compound it over 30 years by using a DB plan. So a lot of the people who say let's not have a define, let's have structural reform mean let's just flip over to 401ks. I, I see the chairman's frustrated, but I, we have a problem. I think there are a set of solutions. I'm happy to come and talk with you about them further. I thank you. And one final point. You, mass, you mentioned about the budget, his budget, Mr. Chairman, massive headcount reductions and and. and and the work that you've done to reduce your operating costs. But I want to look specifically when you say headcount reductions, there's an important 
question I have versus filled position and authorized positions. I, while we, you may have driven down the authorized positions, are we still funding dozens of positions that are vacant? And when you say the headcount reductions, are you talking about the elimination or the reduction of funded yet unfilled positions? I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Keith drill into this uh, because I don't wanna accidentally misrepresent. The main, the main thing I would point out is imagine, because a lot of us have run stuff, so you have all these different departments. Somebody retires or leaves and they come, and they come to me and they say, we're looking to re re fill that position. Our answer almost uniformly for years now has been no, don't. We're going to move somebody over. <laughs> That's how we've been balancing, you know, and living within, within the budget. I, if you think about it, I have not been one of the whiners coming before this committee, even though we have cost escalators, as you well know, in both the health benefit costs and the collective bargaining costs. We've tried to internalize a lot of that cost. Plus, to your great credit, the IT innovation has allowed us to automate a ton of stuff. So we've taken people from one bureau and moved them over to other bureaus. But I'll let Keith answer the question in more detail. Recognizing how late we are and, and, and um, the complexity of this question, I think the simple answer is we had 550 filled positions, not a compliment, 550 filled positions in 2006. Six. We currently have 377 filled positions. Now, we have vacancies that are still in our complement. Those have been reduced as well. I think our current vacancy mm. count is 68. but. That's irrelevant to what happens at Treasury. Those positions aren't being filled. There are no people in them. And the budget that we're talking about today, as it turns out, and as the Treasurer mentioned earlier, is actually um, roughly $2.5 million less than we need to continue to fill 377 positions. The shortfall that we're currently looking at in a flat budget translates into roughly 32 positions that we have to take a look, 32 bodies that in theory we have to take a look at because we have inadequate dollars to pay for those people. But just to quantify, the positions that are being funded yet are not filled. There are Can no positions that are funded and not filled. If we had funding, they'd be filled. Okay. <laughs> but we're not, they could, we're not the husbanding money for some purpose that you're not aware of. The okay. positions that are, that are filled are being funded and all the funds that we get go to those people who are actually there. And there are no vacancies that are being currently funded. There are vacancies that are being carried. They're not being funded. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you.